Our God is still on his throne and ruling the affairs of man. Even as he does not change, his truths have not changed. Thankfully, God still has a people which proclaim that old-time religion, setting forth his sovereignty, and the old pass of truth where we can find rest for our souls. Welcome to Word of Sovereign Grace, a ministry of Paradise Primitive Baptist Church in Arlington, Texas. Get your Bible, call your friends, and sit back as we open the King James Scriptures to explore the glorious word of sovereign grace. Here's this week's message. I want to welcome our visitors this morning. We're grateful that you've taken the opportunity to turn aside. I trust for no other purpose but to worship the Lord. Uh, we feel blessed this morning to have your presence, but we, above all, we beg the Lord's felt presence with us. And uh, without Him, we can do nothing. Uh, I always am thankful for the opportunity to be in the house of the Lord. I'd uh, rather be nowhere else this morning. There's no fishing trip, no golfing, or no shoe shopping. Uh, I, I fight shoe shopping all the time. I had to fight it again last night. But uh, there's nowhere else I'd rather be this morning. You know what the Lord requires of us is not that much. Uh, we're to present our bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is our reasonable service. God doesn't ask of that which is unreasonable, but it's very reasonable. And when we consider the fact of how great things that He's done for us, what what a debt of gratitude we should return by just taking a few hours a week, and I, I pray that it's more than that, but just taking a few hours a week to present ourselves in the presence of the Lord uh, in an assembly. And we're commanded not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together. But as an assembly, we come together. Uh, I know that some people say, well, you know, I can worship God just as well uh, watching TV on Sunday morning. I, I beg to differ with that. I've been there before, then I've been here. And I've been other places in the world. I didn't come here this morning, and I trust that you didn't, to be entertained. But I, I pray that we did truly come together to worship. Uh, God is a spirit, and they that worship, worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. We can't worship God in spirit and in falsehood, or in truth and in the flesh. It must be in spirit and in truth. Uh, I want to turn this morning over to Matthew chapter 11. My mind's been turned there. And I want to look at some things that I trust will be familiar to most of you. And if not, it should be. And if you're not reading your Bible, you should be. Right? Uh, God forbid that any one of you would come here this morning depending completely on what I have to say and that you're not able to check out what I say and does it line up with a thus saith the Lord. Now, there were many, many prophets in times past, those that were inspired of God, that could say... Thus saith the Lord. I can't say that. But I can tell you when the book says it. So, God's people need to be studied. They need to press into the kingdom of God. They need to open the word of God. They need to read it. They need to learn to rightly divide it. So that when you hear something, if the trumpet, you know what does he say? If the trumpet gives an uncertain sound, who shall prepare himself unto battle? So, the gospel is a trumpet if you will, and it gives out a sound. And if it gives an uncertain sound, you need to be able to detect it and you need to be able to uh, watch over me. Now, and we need to watch over one another. So, I hope that you have an understanding of the Word of God. And people that don't read or study during the week, uh, that don't meditate, that don't pray, Normally, 99% of the time, I can see it in their faces that they get absolutely nothing from the preaching service. Uh, but I can tell when those people... I have the, the advantage that you don't have. I can see all your faces. I can see your countenance. And I can watch your reaction to what it is that I, I trust that the Lord gives me to say. Uh, and I can tell. I can tell who's been studying 
who's been talking about the Lord and who's been meditating and praying, I can usually tell. And I, I know there, are, there have been times when I may have a congregation of this size and some people are thumbing through their song books or they're looking at their watch or they're doing, they're distracted somewhere else and there's one person that I see that's on the edge of their seat. Now that's, that is a, a, a situation that I liken unto the, the Lord leaving the 90 and 9 and going after the 1. So it may be the, the fact that Brother Lloyd knows what I'm talking about. It may be the fact that sometimes uh, it's, uh, the message is only intended for one. I hope that's not the case this morning. I pray that the Lord has prepared your heart to receive His Word and that it find a lodging place, that it find good ground, the good ground of the heart, that it might bring forth some 30, 60, and 100 fold to the praise and the honor and glory of our God. Uh, so we know that the, the Word of God that we... Um, that we believe that we use is the King James. Uh, I, I don't want to go off on a rabbit trail to to give the evidences why that I use that and why I believe that it's the pure Word of God, uh, preserved preserved for us today. Um, but we're living in a day when this book is not popular. We see a lot of oppos- opposition to the Word of God. And even to being a Christian nowadays, uh, the Christians are being persecuted People are going out of their way to find a Christian baker. Uh, say, say for instance, you've heard it on the news, a, some, a homosexual couple wants to get married, and they go out of their way to find a Christian baker and force them to violate their, their godly principles, and they make a big deal out of it. The people wind up losing their business and so on. Now, I could give a lot of examples, but we're under attack today, and the people don't like... Uh, the world doesn't like the Word of God. And the reason the world doesn't like the Word of God is because the Word of, the word of God holds God's people responsible. Okay? Many out in the world today, they don't want to be responsible. They don't want to be uh, responsible because if they're responsible, then they have to become obedient to what it is that this Word says. That's the whole thing about evolution. The, the big deal about evolution, they're trying to prove that there is no God. All this just happened from a big bang 40 billion years ago, and here we are. You know, you, we were some primordial, primordial ooze, and then we crawled out and we became some kind of sea creature, then we crawled onto the land, and here we are today. Well, all of that, and then they make the universe so vast and so great, even when the Word of God says it has ends, and that the Lord stands above it, uh, they make it so great that, that it's incomprehensible. All of this is just an effort to try to prove that there is no God, and they want to say there is no God because they don't want to be responsible, because if they're responsible, then they have to obey. Right? <laughs> does it make sense? I, I think that it does. Uh, but there is a God, and, and He lives. And just like the song that we sang, He lives today. He came out of that grave uh, on the morning of the resurrection, and He appeared unto the Father with that wave offering uh, on, the, on the Feast of First Fruits. Uh, that 144,000, I'm, I'm kind of, I ain't even got to my text yet. Y'all pray for me if you will. Uh, He came out of that grave. He's not there. You can go to any other major religion and you'll find that there's a grave a grave site where where Muhammad's at and he's there. And Buddha and so on and so on. But you go to the uh, supposedly where the tomb where Christ is at. I don't think it's where where the, uh, uh, the majority religion says it is, but I guarantee you that grave is empty. There's no one in there because he came out and he rose victorious over death, sin, hell, and the grave. And he's done it for our justification. And we have a lot to be thankful about that. You know, you can't preach the resurrection of Jesus Christ in a lot of places, especially in the days of the apostles. It was unheard of. And they were persecuted, and they were thrown in prison, and they were beaten because they they taught and uh, and preached the things that we take for granted. The fact that Jesus is alive and that He's coming back and He's going to raise our vile bodies from the grave. You couldn't preach that then, and you can't preach it in a lot of places today. We talk about Christian uh, persecution, even during this time of of Ramadan, uh, uh, when when the uh, uh, 
the Islamic faith is very charged and, and very riled up. We find see that there are many Coptic Christians in Egypt that are being slaughtered and murdered just for professing the name of Jesus Christ. Let's not take for granted this, this privilege and this freedom that we have here today because we may not always have it. Christians are still being beheaded around the world today. They're being slaughtered just for taking the name of Jesus Christ. And uh, many of these people are refusing to pronounce their faith. They're refusing and they're dying in the name of the Lord. Uh, It's serious. What we believe, this is not just some game that we're playing. We, We worship the true and the living God. And to take a stand for the Lord Jesus Christ... Oh, it may cost us our life someday. But you know what the saying is? If you don't take a stand for something, you're liable to fall for everything. But we take a stand and we profess that Jesus Christ is God in the flesh. He is God manifest in the flesh. He is fully God and He is fully man. And uh, Okay, I'm going to try it now. I've got that out of the way. Let me get over here to Matthew chapter 11 and I'm going to read, do some reading. Uh, here's where the Lord he says a lot of things in here one of the things he talks about uh, about the kingdom of God uh, suffering violence and he said all the prophets prophesied until John and he that hath ears to hear let him hear is one of the things that he talks about having ears to hear everyone has ears now there are some people that are born into the world that are, that are deaf that can't hear audibly but this is not necessarily talking about the audible voice. Hearing audibly, it's, a, it's about discerning between the spiritual and, and the carnal. Not every man has the ability to discern the spiritual. He says, But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, neither can he know them, for they're spiritually discerned. They're foolishness unto him. A man that is in a state of nature, a man that has not been born of the Spirit of God, cannot hear the Word of God. He cannot understand it. He cannot perceive it. And therefore he will not uh, be responsible, neither will he obey it. Right? But Jesus said, He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. That's the same message the Lord gave to the uh, the church in Asia. Uh, he says, uh, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. And He says, He that hath an ear to hear what the Spirit saith to the churches. That is not talking to an individual. That's talking to an unrepentant church. That's talking about a church that stands in need to repent of what it is they're doing. He that hath ears to hear, let him hear what the Spirit saith to the churches. So everybody has natural ears, but not everybody has uh, spiritual ears or understanding. Well, there's another text that comes to mind. It says, um, Unto you it is given to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it is not given. Therefore are these things done in parables. You say, well, Brother Keith, I thought the purpose of the Word of God was to help us to understand. I thought the purpose of a parable was to give us understanding of the Word. Absolutely not. The purpose of a parable is not to reveal, but it's to conceal. And that's what he says. Unto you it is given, unto them it's not. So the idea that you think that anyone can pick up this Word, read it and understand it, that's not, that's not scriptural. And there's many places that we could go to talk about that. But he that hath ears to hear, let him hear. Well, we, we find that when um, Peter and the apostles were gathered together at one time, and the Lord began to ask, who do the people say that I am? And they began to give answers. And Peter, they got to Peter and Peter says, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Christ responded to him by saying, Blessed art thou, Simon of Jonah, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. See, the fact of the matter to know that Jesus Christ is, is by divine revelation. It comes by divine revelation. In other words, God's in control of it. Your Sunday school teacher or your grandmother, however sincere they might be, or your mother or dad or anyone else is not in control of that. God has got to reveal it to us. God reveals that Jesus Christ is, and and He reveals His truth to us. I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself, but let me keep reading. Um, Verse 15, 
He that has ears to hear, let him hear. But whereunto, whereunto shall I liken this generation? Now, time context is important. I want you to understand that this particular thing that he is saying is written to that generation. Not some future generation, but that generation. That generation that, that uh, John the Baptist called vipers. <laughs> All right? <laughs> that, that same generation. He says, Whereunto shall I liken this generation? It is like unto children sitting in the markets and calling unto their fellows and saying, We have piped unto you and you have not danced. We have mourned unto you and you have not lamented. For John came neither eating nor drinking, and they say he hath a devil. Uh, you know, there's, there's a lot that I could get into right there, but I'm, I'm not going to. But that has to do with the Nazarite vow. John came with a Nazarite vow. Uh, but the Son of Man came eating, eating and drinking. And that's telling you that, the, uh, that Jesus Christ did not have a Nazarite vow on Him, and neither did He have long hair. Uh, if you had a Nazarite vow, you could have long hair. But according to the law, unless you had a Nazarite vow, you could not. Let me push on. Verse 20. Then began he to upbraid the cities wherein most of his mighty works were done because they repented not. Woe unto thee, Chorazan. Woe unto thee, unto thee, Bethsaida. For if the mighty works which were done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. But I say unto you, it shall be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon at the day of judgment than for you. And thou, Capernaum, which are exalted unto heaven, shall be brought down to hell. For if the mighty works which had been done in thee had been done in Sodom, it would have remained unto this day. But I say unto you, it shall be more tolerable for that land of Sodom in the day of judgment than for thee. Now, I want you to consider the fact that O Baptists believe what the Bible teaches, that we believe in what's called time deliverance or time salvation. Now, if there is time deliverance and time salvation, there's also time condemnation and timely judgment. Does it make sense? And timely condemnation. Uh, now, I don't want to get too deep into the doctrines of grace this morning, but I want you to just keep that in mind that the day of judgment that is being spoken of here is AD 70. That is when Jerusalem was destroyed. Now, you have to consider the fact that there was a 40-year period beginning in AD 30 uh, when uh, Jesus began His ministry uh, at about 26 on the Day of Atonement, about 26 AD, and He wrapped it up three and a half years later in 30 AD on the, on the Day of Passover. Okay? Uh, his earthly ministry. And He ascended some 40 days later, right? So there was a 40-year period, and this was a time of transformation. God has been done with the Jews. He, he says when, when Christ died on the cross, the oblation and the sacrifice were to cease. In other words, all the sacrificial sacrifices of Moses that have been done, I mean the multiplied millions, who knows, only the Lord knows how many, all that blood that was shed that pointed to the one ultimate sacrifice that once and forever uh, redeemed God's people from their sins, and that's the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Once that took place, the oblation and sacrifice ceased to be recognized by God. Even though the Jews continued to do it, God didn't recognize it anymore once that Jesus laid down His life for His sheep. Uh, there was a, that began a 40-year period uh, of trial and tribulation. Go back, you see the same 40-year period or a similar 40-year period with Moses. Uh, when the children of Israel were 40 years in the wilderness before they came into the promised land. But this time after Jesus uh, died and rose, from, rose again was a, a time of judgment. It was a, the days of vengeance of God that He promised. Look, 21, 22, you'll see it there. Uh, that when He poured out His wrath upon the nation of Israel for their rejection of Him, for their turning His back on Him, for them crying out saying, His blood be upon us and our children. When they uh, desired a murderer rather than the Son of God being delivered from Pilate, they desired Barabbas. Now I know some say, well, Barabbas is a picture of the scapegoat. Well, there's only th one thing wrong with that. Uh, I believe he's a picture of the substitutionary death 
all right, of Christ dying in the room in place of, of sinners, even murderers like Barabbas. But there's only one problem with making Barabbas the scapegoat. It's not on the Day of Atonement. It's on the Day of Passover. Now, that's another subject also. But he goes on to talk about that judgment. And I think that judgment that's under consideration here is, is uh, God uh, suffering the law to fade away. All right, there was a 40-year period where even some of the Christian disciples wanted to keep the law. They wanted to keep the feast. And that's talked about in Romans chapter 14 and in the book of Corinthians. Uh, and they were suffered or allowed to. Uh, some of the Jewish converts, that is. Uh, but the Gentiles didn't pick up those things. Uh, so there was a, a re- this was referred to as a time of reformation. He talks about the carnal ordinances and the divers' washings imposed upon them until the time of Reformation. And that's in the book of Hebrews that Paul talks about that. So, there was a, t- there was a change. Uh, God was done with the law. He says, the law and the prophets were until John. Since that time, the kingdom of God is preached and every man presses into it. The law came by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. So God is done with the, with the law, and now He's going to establish the foundation of the church, uh, of the Lord Jesus Christ. And He's going to suffer the law to fade away, and He's going to stand the church up. And we know that the Scripture talks about how that it, these, He told them to go into the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Did you know that they did that in less than 40 years? Colossians 1.6, Colossians 1.23 proves it. The Apostle Paul said it, that he had preached the gospel to every creature which is under heaven. So, all for the purpose of establishing the foundation of the church. And brothers and sisters, the church, the foundation has been laid for a long time. And then there is no other foundation that can be laid. But Jesus Christ, uh, uh, the apostles and the prophets, and Jesus Christ Himself being the cornerstone. The foundation was laid in that 40 year period. And as God was judging the Jews for their rejection of Him, they were eyewitnesses of the miracles of God. No, some of us say, you know, if I had to live back in the day of Jesus, I wouldn't have done what those Jews did. Well, you know what? They had judicial blindness upon them. It says in one place, they having eyes cannot see, they having ears they cannot, uh, uh, having ears they cannot hear, and eyes they cannot perceive, because their heart is wax gross. They had judicial blindness upon them. And you think that it can't be done. Even Paul talks about how that the God of the world hath blinded the minds of them that believe not. God's people can be blinded. And it didn't, I didn't say they're going to hell. You never heard me say that. You never, you never will hear me say that. Say that I, I have no insight to open the Lamb's book of life, and neither do you. There's only one that's worthy to open the seals and look thereon, and that's the Lord Jesus Christ Himself. You'll never hear me judge anyone to hell. But the Lord can do it. He did it several times. <laughs> he told those Pharisees, He said, How can you escape the damnation of hell? He can say that. I can't. Why? Because He's God and I'm not. It's not our business to judge anyone to hell. I know that the Scripture says, By their fruits you'll know them. We can know who a person is serving, but we don't know where they're going li- uh, to live in glory or not. Now, I I like to believe that people are manifesting the fruit of the Spirit. That if they love God, that's an evidence. Uh, We know that we have passed from death unto life because we love the brethren. Whosoever loveth is born of God. Whoever doeth righteousness is born of Him. I I like to think that I can see those evidences in you and believe that you are heaven bound. But, but you know what? Even a child of God can have a bad day. And you might see me sometime having a bad day. And say, well, boy, he sure isn't a child of God. Look at the way he's acting. Any of you ever get in the flesh? No, I know Paul did. <clears throat> Paul said, did Paul say, I am the Indian of sinners? No, he said he's the chief. And he said, when I would do good, evil is present with me. We have a fight and a warfare that's set up within us once we're born of the Spirit of God. And the flesh and the Spirit are contrary one to another. 
If you have that struggle within you, one part of you wants to go to church and read your Bible and pray and uh, just let your old friends go their way, and another part of you wants to go with your old friends and do the same old things that got you and keeps getting you in trouble, that's an evidence that you're born of the Spirit of God because you have two natures within you. Everyone that's born into this world has the endemic nature, the fallen nature of Adam. It's a carnal nature. And it's total. He says the carnal nature is enmity with God. It's not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. But those of us, uh, once you're born of the Spirit of God, you have that divine nature of God uh, that lives within. And you have a struggle that's set up. An inward fight. And that's, that is our whole duty toward God is to bring our flesh under subjection to the honor, glory, and praise of God. So, <clears throat> that judgment that took place uh, A.D. 70, the Lord destroyed the temple and the, uh, there's many people that ran to the... By the way, you think that Matthew 24 is talking about the end of time when he says, let them which be in Judea flee unto the mountains. You think... Okay, first of all, am I supposed to get on a plane, go to Judea, then flee to the mountains? No, it was for those people that lived in that region. And I guarantee you, when it comes to the end of time, now what what I'm talking about, the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70, that was the time of the end. There's a difference between the time of the end and the end of time. Daniel talks about the time of the end. Okay, but the end of time, and there is a day coming when time will be no more. But the time it was the end of the law, of the Jewish economy, the Jewish dispensation of law worship. That was the end that's under consideration. But do you think that at the end of time that you're going to be able to run to the mountains to hide from God? No, the Lord was telling His people that so they they could escape the Roman armies. The Roman armies of Titus that, that encamp, uh, uh, encircled Jerusalem for three and a half years. And for, for you Bible studiers, let me throw something out for you. You ever heard of a time and a times and half a time? A time is one, times is two, so two and one is three, and a half a time is three and a half. That's three and a half years. Or how about this? 1,260 days. That's 42 months. Have you ever read about 42 months? 1,260 days, three and a half years, a time and times and half a time. They're all saying the same thing. Three and a half years was Jerusalem encompassed by the Roman armies. And they were starved out. 1,100,000 dead bodies in that place. People were reduced to cannibalism. And they were reduced to picking from the dung hills in order to find something to eat. That was the great tribulation that, that, the, that the Word of God talks about. That was He said there wouldn't be another time like it after. Giving a space of time after the great tribulation. I know that uh, uh, premillennialism teaches that the great tribulation is to come. I believe that the Scripture teaches that it's been fulfilled. That That's not to say that we won't have tribulation. We will. But the great tribulation, I believe, uh, is directed uh, specifically toward A.D. 70 and all those things that happened. One million, one hundred thousand dead bodies stacked in that city. People were wishing for death and it would not come. You want to get a very good description of it, where do you think I would send you for it? I want to send you to Deuteronomy chapter 28 and you go over there and read that. And the first part of it says, this is what will happen if you obey. And only just a few verses. Then the Lord says, here's what's going to happen if you disobey because He knew that they were going to disobey. And it lays it out and it talks about the great tribulation in Deuteronomy chapter 28. Go read it and see and look at it and see if you don't see some evidences there uh, that it was talking about the destruction of, of Jerusalem. Now, I, I want to get on a positive note. Uh, I, don't, I don't want to leave you hanging thinking that it's all gloom and doom because it is not. It is not all gloom and doom. It was for those Jews. Uh, and I, I will say this much, that anyone that's unrepentant and refuses to obey the Lord, you're probably not going to have a, a, very, uh, a very comforting or assuring life. Okay? Okay? Uh, 
So verse 25, he says, and Jesus, at that time, Jesus, at that time. Now notice, he's setting the context again. Time context is important. But context says, who's doing the speaking? Who's being spoken to? What are they talking about? Where was it and when was it? When was it? Now, you can't always discern every aspect of the context, but here he specifically, specifically tells us, at that time, Jesus answered and said, I thank thee, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because thou hast hid these things from the wise and prudent, and hast revealed them unto babes. Now, here's further evidence that the things of God, he's talking about the judicial blindness that was on uh, the Pharisees and, and some, some of the Jews. He says, I thank you that these, uh, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because thou hast hid these things from the wise and prudent and has revealed them unto babes. The wise and prudent are those that know everything and they'll tell you so. Right? But, he says, but has revealed them unto babes. What well, is what? They went down to the uh, seminary and got these truths? No, they've been revealed by God. They've been revealed unto, unto babes. There's the key. Babes. You know, at one time, some little children were approaching the Lord and the apostles said, you get back. The Lord said, mm -mm. Suffer the little children to come unto me and forbid them not, for of such is the kingdom of heaven. And he goes on to say, except any man, except the kingdom, uh, enter, except a man humble himself as a little child, he cannot enter into the kingdom of heaven. Now, I didn't say that he's not going to heaven after this life. The kingdom of heaven is here, and it's now. We have to understand the nature of God's kingdom as a spiritual kingdom. And hopefully we're like, we hear like what John, when God told John, come up hither, come up a little higher, put away the things of the world and of this life for a little while, focus on the Lord and He'll allow you to come up a little higher. <clears throat> no, but it has revealed them unto babes, those that have humbled themselves in the sight of God. He says, God resists the proud, but He gives grace to the humble. You want to, you want to reveal... <clears throat> Uh, understand the things of God, you have to understand that God reveals them. I know this runs contrary to what we like to think. Well, i got to rush and tell my neighbor all about the Lord before he gets in a car wreck and he goes to hell. Right? Remember what Paul said, and Paul drew from, from Jeremiah and I think in Ezekiel. He says, And they shall not teach every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord. For all shall know me from the least unto the greatest. John 6.45 it says they shall all be taught of God. What? Me not, it's not my responsibility to get my neighbor saved? Uh, for heaven and world of glory? Absolutely not. But you know what we can, where we are beneficial is in conversion. We can be, in, we, we can be a vessel meet for the master's use in conversion. Let me give you an example. Um, by the way, remember it says, they shall not teach every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, know the Lord, for all shall know me, from the least to the greatest. That means that God's going to do it. So let me give you an example of how, uh, make a distinguish between this. Lazarus, La the Lord waited purposely four days before he went to the grave. And I think it was, was it Martha that said, Lord, behold, he stinketh. He purposely, we know that after three days the body begins to see corruption. He purposely waited. And the Lord told them to remove, the, roll away the stone. And he said, Lazarus, come forth. <laughs> By the way, I can back up and let me get a, just a, a small rabbit right here. This is just a small rabbit trail. Before that it talked about that Jesus wept. Now, why can you think the Lord knows He's getting ready to bring Lazarus back from the dead, and He wept. You know what? When you leave the body, you know where you go? To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. To be I, There's no limbo. There's no halfway house. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And Jesus wept because He knew He was bringing Lazarus back in this world of sin and sorrow. That's what I understand. If you've got a better understanding, I'll listen to it. 
But anyway, he said, Lazarus, come forth. And, and in that day and time, they were bound hand and foot with the spices and they were wrapped sort of like a mummy, just for your give you a, a visual. And I can picture Lazarus floating out of that tomb. Then, then after he, after he came to life, the Lord said to those that were standing by, loose him and let him go. That's the purpose of the gospel ministry. That's the purpose of a, of a good steward of the manifold grace of God is to tell, uh, help God's people get out of their grave clothes. A lot of God's people are walking around. They're alive. Uh, they have the Spirit of God, but they're still wearing their grave clothes. They haven't put on the robe of the righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ. They're still eating their own bread and wearing their own apparel. You see, that's what Isaiah said. In that, in that day, there will be seven women taking hold of one man, saying, let us eat our own bread, let us wear our own apparel, but let us be called by thy name to take away our reproach. In other words, we're going we're gonna to have our own doctrine, we're going to walk our own way, but we just want to be called Christians so we don't have to suffer persecution. Oh, so we're, so we're not reproached. I see that all around us today. All around us. No, but they, uh, a lot of God's people are still wearing their grave clothes, and that's the purpose of the gospel ministry. And, um, and being a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ, you can be like that wild Gadarean. You remember after the Lord cast all those, that legion of devils out of him, and he says, Go and tell your friends how great things the Lord had done for thee. That's the purpose of the gospel ministry. The gospel, the gospel doesn't get anybody saved for heaven. Not, a particular, not anyone. We're saved by the grace of God plus nothing. Jesus Christ finished the work that God gave Him to do and He entered once into the holy place having obtained eternal redemption for us. It's done. It is finished. Jesus said it is finished. Now who of us think that there's something that we can do that measure up? to help the Lord out. <clears throat> no, the Scripture says, Thou shalt call His name Jesus, for He shall save His people from their sins. didn't say He'll try. He'll give it a go. No, He shall save His people from their sins. And I believe that He did it. That's why He's called the Savior. <clears throat> if Jesus needed the cooperation of dead alien sinners, men that are dead in trespasses and sins, not a single one would ever help. Not a single one would ever help. Okay, so these things have been hidden from the wise and prudent and revealed to babes. Even so, Father, for so it seemed good in thy sight. And all things are delivered un unto me of my Father, and no man knoweth the Son uh, but the Father. Neither any man knoweth the Father save the Son. And he to whomsoever the Son will reveal him. Did you catch that? You're not going to know the Father. You're not going to know the Son except the Lord reveals it to you. Language doesn't get any simpler. <clears throat> People have the idea. Coming out with all these new perversions, supposedly the Word of God, and by the way, things that are different aren't the same. They're all different. God only has one standard. <clears throat> they think, well, we come out with this new version, we'll make it more understandable. Run, Jesus, run. See, Jesus, run. Now, don't you understand that? You're met, they're missing the point. The, the truth is that God reveals Himself to whomsoever He will. It doesn't matter the simplicity of language. You say, well, the King James is hard for me to read. This is a poetic language. If, did you know that if you ever read uh, the, the translator's notes in the front of a King James, that they don't talk like the Bible does? They talk like you and I do. But this is a language that I believe <clears throat> is designed when you hear it, you know without a doubt that you're hearing the Word of God. It's a beautiful, poetic language, and I, I'm thankful for it. No, uh, college education or, or a simplicity of language or none of those things are going to reveal the truth to you. God has got to reveal the truth to you. Well, that takes away all my power. 
and I can't cooperate exactly. That's exactly right. You know what you know what that lends to? That lends into the doctrine of the sovereignty of God. He is the potter, we are the clay. Now does the thing form say unto him that formed it, Why hast thou made me thus? God forbid. God is God. He can do whatever He wants. He don't have to ask me. He don't have to ask you or anyone else. Right? Daniel 4.35 All the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing before Him. And He doeth according to His will among the armies of heaven and the inhabitants of the earth. And none can stay His hand or say unto Him, What doest thou? Nobody. God performs His will. Now I'm talking about the the decreed will of God. I I don't have time to get into the aspects of the will of God. Uh, But there's the decreed will of God, there's a suffering will of God, and the will of God's command. uh, Wherein we become responsible in that realm. uh, That's another subject. So, and to whomsoever the Son will reveal Him. Now if you can hear this message... This is evidence that you belong to Him. If you have a desire, if you have a desire to go to heaven, you know that's an evidence that you're heaven bound. Because there's an old saying among some of the old, older preachers that said, "If you have it, or if you want it, you already have it. Don't want it, you can't get it." I believe that. If you want to live in heaven, it's an evidence that you're born of the Spirit of God. But what comes into question is how mature are we spiritually? How much have we grown in knowledge and in grace? How much have we pressed into the Word of God? How much have we prayed and meditated and separated ourselves from the world? That's the question. How near have you drawn unto God? He says, draw nigh unto me and I'll draw nigh unto you. But we don't do it with lip service. Because he said, this people doth, he talked about the Pharisees, this people doth honor me with their lips. But their hearts are far from me. God knows your heart. You you know, people can fool me. They do it all the time. Play tricks on me. Or tell me one thing, and right in their heart, they're thinking something completely different. You you ever done that? We've all been guilty of it. Someone asks you a question, and and you give that that fake smile, but inside you're saying something completely different. God discerns that. God knows the thoughts and the intents of our heart. You better believe that He does. Because He does. He knows your, everything you're thinking right now, everything you've ever thought about, and everything you're going to think about, He knows it. That ought to cause you to sober up and think, think seriously about what you think about. Right? He, the, Paul talks about casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. Start guarding what you let in your mind. That's where you need to stop it. You have the authority to say, Get thee behind me, Satan. If you let bad thoughts in, you let them fester, and you, uh, <laughs> you're going to have a problem. I, I don't know how this fits in, but I'll go ahead with it. I hear people all, all the time, you know, uh, they're always saying the grass is greener on the other side. Yeah, anybody ever heard that? The grass is greener over there on the other side of the hill. <clears throat> Let me suggest that you try to get the watering hose out and water the grass where you're at. <laughs> Have you ever thought about that? Maybe, maybe a little fertilizer. The grass can be green right where you're at. It depends on if you're watering it and you're taking care of it. But you get over on the other side where you think it's greener, guess what? After a while, you're going to find out it's you that's not taking care of the lawn. You've got to water the grass right where you're at. You've got to take care of where you're at. You've got to fertilize it where you're at. You've got to mow it where you're at. You've got to edge it where you're at. <clears throat> if that analogy is for someone, take it for what it's worth. Come unto me. All you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Are you looking for rest? Are you look? Are you truly looking for rest? There's a scripture that comes to mind, Jeremiah six sixteen. Stand ye in the ways and see, and ask for the old paths. 
Wherein is a good way where you will find rest for your souls. But they said, we will not walk therein. That's a shame. There's a rest for the people of God. Paul says there remaineth a rest for the people of God. Well, what? We have to die to our own works. We have to labor to enter into that rest. There's a rest for you here today and now. You can have the comfort and the peace and the joy of the Holy Ghost. And you can have the assurance to know that heaven is your home. And that Jesus bought and paid for your sins. And He forgave you. I don't care what it is you've done. I don't care what sin you've committed. And I don't believe a child of God commit blasphemy against the Holy Ghost. I don't care what it is. The Lord forgave you freely. He put your sin away on Calvary's cross. You belong to Him. You've been washed in the blood of the Lamb. Now He invites you to come unto Him. If, if you labor in this world and you're heavy laden because of, of all the things that are taking place and you can't carry the weight, give it to Him. Lay it at the foot of the cross. He says, I will give you rest. Now He tells us what we're to do. Take My yoke upon you and learn of Me. For I am meek and lowly in heart and you shall find rest under your souls. For My yoke is easy and My burden is light. Take My yoke upon you and learn of Me. What if you, now stop and you just ask yourselves, what have I been learning the past week? What have I been learning about? Now, <clears throat> tell yourself... That's the reason that I'm not experiencing rest. That's the reason I'm not having comfort. Because I focus my mind and my heart on things besides the Lord. Just want to be honest, right? We're all we're all guilty. We're all guilty. We have if we're not don't have a time set aside, a quiet time. It's thirty minutes a day. You say, well, I don't have time. You've always got time for the things you put first. You know, we're all dysfunctional, right? We're all dysfunctional. i got this function to go to and that function and another function, so we're dysfunctional. But we always have time for the things we put first. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. What are those all things? Food, clothing, shelter. God will see. God's not going to... Uh, uh, you know, an airplane or a, car, uh, a cargo hold from an airplane is not going to drop in your backyard with, that was headed to Walmart with everything you need. But God's going to make sure that you have, uh, that you'll be able to provide for your family. A, a roof, food, clothing, pay the electricity. Alright? Seek ye first. Put your priorities. Right. Find a time, if it's only 30 minutes a day, quiet time. Get up before everybody gets up and get your Bible out and read and pray and meditate. I guarantee you it will make, you will have a better day. It doesn't mean that you're not going to have problems during the day, but you're going to get through it a lot easier. Put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ. Make no provision for the flesh. Um, but he, you have the invitation to come unto Christ. And that's where you're going to find rest. You're not going to find it anywhere else. You're not going to find rest in having a $584,000 401k. You're not going to find rest anywhere else. You're going to find rest in the Lord. The world is not your friend. By the way, the Bible tells us that friendship with the world is enmity with God. Just like the carnal mind is enmity with God, the friendship with the world is enmity with God. We need to have our priorities right. We need to press toward the mark of the high calling of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. There's many, many benefits and blessings, even though we, we trust that we assemble together for the purpose to worship the Lord. He blesses us. He sheds His abundant mercies on us, even though we don't deserve the least of it. You, you have to come to an understanding that this sovereign God that we serve is also a God of love and compassion, and He's a God of help, and He's right there when you need Him. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And that's not talking about getting to heaven. You get in a jam during the week, you get in a jam at work, you get a, wherever, you, you have trouble, you call upon the name of the Lord, and He's promised that He'll deliver you. 
Alright? Trust Him. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. And acknowledge Him in all thy ways and He shall direct thy steps. I thank you all for your good attention. As we stand to sing a suitable hymn, one or more has the desire to unite with this body, this will be your opportunity. Word of Sovereign Grace, a ministry of Paradise Primitive Baptist Church in Arlington, Texas. Paradise Primitive Baptist Church is located at 5300 Mansfield Road in Arlington, Texas. Services begin at 1030 each Sunday morning. Plan to come and worship with us. To find out more about Paradise Primitive Baptist Church, visit www.paradisepbc.org. Be sure to visit our website for articles, video, and audio sermons, as well as biblical answers to your questions. Thanks for watching, and be sure to join us again next week. May God richly bless you.